Duo Minority Advising Programs and Minority Recruitment Officers Conference held April 20th and 21st at Valdosta State University in Valdosta, Georgia. This segment features the closing banquet held on April 21st, 1995 at the Comfort Inn in Valdosta. The special speaker is director of the National Black Student Retention Conference, Dr. Clinita Ford. I have the distinct honor of introducing our guest speaker this evening. And it is a real pleasure indeed, because as I was listening to the song this evening, something inside of me so strong that I know I can make it, I was thinking about Dr. Clinita Ford, because those of us who know her know that that is the epitome of what she is and what she stands for. Dr. Ford is a world-renowned educator and one who has labored in the vineyards for a long, long time. She has served in some capacity or the other at Florida A&M for, she told me, over a certain number of years. <laughs> she told me more specific. But the point that I'm making is, is that this is one that is not a Susie come lately. We used to use the expression uh, when we were really trying to make the point about someone's expertise. We say, well, she really wrote the book on this subject. But literally, as we talk about retention of students and in particularly people of color, uh, Dr. Clinita Ford has really written the book on this issue. Many of us know her from her very successful conference, the National Conference on Black Student Retention, that draws folk from all over the country to come and hear what she has to say and what she has planned. She's also, uh, as I, I tell people when I talk about Dr. Ford, I say she's a legend in her own day. Uh, certainly not too long ago, she was inducted into the National Black Alumni Hall of Fame. And the thing that really sets her apart and, and gives me great pleasure in terms of introducing her. And you notice I'm not doing it in the traditional way about where she got her education from and how many awards she has. And because as, as you think about a person of her stature, those kinds of things aren't important. What's important is the footprints that she have left in the sand. And certainly she has been a mentor for many of us in higher education, if not in terms of personal contact by example. And certainly, we look to her to show us the way. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time telling you about the many awards and accolades that she's had and that she continues to get. Let me just tell you that we had to book her a year in advance. <laughs> that kind of tells you about not only her schedule, but the magnitude of the individual that we bring to you this evening as our keynote speaker. So please join me in giving Dr. Ford a real Georgia welcome. Thank you so much for that good, warm, southern hospitality type of introduction. And I bring you greetings from your northern neighbor, southern neighbor, Florida, sister institution, Florida A&M University, and from the National Higher Education Conference on Black Student Retention. And to invite each of you, and particularly if each cannot come, that your institutions will be represented at this year's conference, which will be November 13 through 18 in Washington, D.C., at the D.C. Renaissance uh, Hotel. We are addressing minority student retention relates to Goals 2000. I have on the table here some cards uh, about the conference, and you can call us toll free, 1-800-USA-GRAD, and we'd be more than delighted to send you a registration, a conference brochure with all of the 
information. I have been so delighted to share the day and the evening with you. I attended uh, several visits, short visits, several sessions this morning, and I looked at the topics in, in your program for this conference, and I said to Dr. Silva, you know, uh, these are some of the kinds of things that I plan to talk about tonight. And then the one o'clock opening session, which was just terrific. I don't know if I've ever heard a person in the position of the chancellor who really has expressed the kind of commitment that he did. Uh, you are to be commended in Georgia that you have that kind of leadership. And I think he really meant business. You know, I heard the message. And I think that it's, you know, follow or get out of the way. Because he says that he wants results. And actually, you know, that's what retention is too. Retention is results. Retention is not a process. It's the results of many things. He talked about four of his principles or ideas, and I'm going to expand a little, and I've got what I call four seven principles that I'm going to share with you tonight. And they are institutional commitment, institutional accountability, a user-friendly campus, bonding, outreach, partnerships, established comfort factor, caring and nurturing of freshmen and sophomores, and a caring and nurturing faculty on institutional commitment. The primary commitment of an institution must be to its students, because without the students, there's no need for you, regardless of how good you are, and there's no need for all the other things you do, regardless of how important they are. Therefore, your primary concern in all of your actions must be what is best for the student. How will this benefit or hurt the student? So the central theme is the student. Now there is a philosophy out there that many of the institutions have a preoccupation with retention uh, based on dwindling enrollment and diminishing financial resources rather than the welfare of a student who for whatever reason drops out. These institutions are guilty of doing anything to get the student in, and then it's sink or swim. Even though they tend to put in their mission statement and to publish in their catalogs that they serve to meet the needs of the student, but it doesn't happen that way. What happens is once the student gets there, they're roped in, the game plan changes, and then the student is jumping through all kinds of hoops to meet your needs. It's bait and switch, and it's just high class, sophisticated, academic fraud. Retention. <laughs> to be effective must be mandated from the top, and you have that in Georgia. I think the presidents of the institutions will feel or do feel the prick, and you're going to feel it, and that's the way to get the attention. You know, you don't pay any mind to it unless it comes from the top. That's the only way to get everybody's attention. And it must include all employees, excluding no units of the institution. Retention is everybody's job. Now, some of the highest complaint errors that I hear as I travel about the country with dissatisfaction of students is financial aid, and it's not about money. It's about the way they are treated. The registrar's office, and it's not about grades, it's about the way people talk to them and how they are received. Admissions office, the same thing. Receptionists in the various offices. Housing, it's about not getting prompt responses and being just knocked and shoved around. 
student services. They're not too pleased with that and security. And you say, where on earth does security come in this? They feel as though the only thing security is for is to give them tickets. <laughs> <laughs> Now, actually, you know, there was a case. There was a case where some parents had brought their uh, child to enroll at an institution and not on financial aid, not asking for anything, paying from the hip pocket. And while they are in the administration building getting everything settled and paying, you know, out of the pocket, they come out and find a parking ticket on the car. So you say, you know, what do they have to do? Everybody has an impact on the student. Uh, retention actually uh, is for everybody's benefit too, because your purpose on campus is for the student. Um, there's no students, no need for you. So if you have high attrition, low enrollment, retrenchment, a budget downsize, and positions cut, you know, it could be you who's getting out. <laughs> Social security. It can be a little selfish. I know your mother's always told you not to be selfish, but this time I'm gonna give you permission to be selfish. <laughs> because we are marching toward one third of the nation being minorities. And currently, one worker supports 30 persons on Social Security. Just around the corner, year 2000, one worker will have to support 50. Now my math tells me that that means less for each person. My math also tells me that if these students are not graduating to get professional jobs, to get professional salaries, to pay good money into Social Security, something's gonna happen to you young folks out there. I, I, I've already got mine, I've retired, so <laughs> I, I got ahead of it. <laughs> and then there's a matter of personal safety. People with jobs are less likely to engage in crime against body and property because they have the funds. Retention should be written into the strategic plan of every unit in the institution and monitored for achievement. Retention performance can be part of the evaluation for salary, rank, tenure, promotion, merit bonus, certificates of recognition or whatever, but there should be recognition. Now, we're talking about positive environment. Along with this and institutional commitment, we have got to have fair and equitable policies and practices at the institutional level. They must be inclusive and not exclusive. Include your students. We talk about them and to them, we need to talk with them. They should be part of your decision-making committees, part of the president's cabinet or council, or whatever it's called, and then there should be informal sessions with them. You should also be mindful that the institution serves the student and that's the privilege for the institution to serve the student rather than a privilege for the student to be here. So show courtesy, be prompt in response and replies, and be friendly. And be mindful too that students are humans and they have feelings. Eliminate all of those long lines that you put them in to go back to another long line, to go to another one to come back to where they started from and stand in line again. We call those boomerang students because you just throw them out and they come right back. You think that makes them feel good? No, recycle. Be mindful that students have pride and we need to be careful about these labels that give a negative connotation. You know, I don't subscribe to at-risk students Students are at at-risk situations. We create those conditions for them. I think I heard, I think it was the president, uh, if you didn't say it, forgive me, T today that, you know, there are students identified who have the ability to do. So you see, they're not at risk, they've got the ability. They've just been put into situations where they cannot perform or have not performed. Now, 
I say everybody's at risk. You're at risk of failing, at risk of succeeding, uh, at risk of everything. But we, we, we make a negative connotation to that and to developmental and remedial. I would hate to think that there's any course anywhere that doesn't develop you. If it doesn't develop you, what, what is it going to do for you? You don't need to be in there if it doesn't help you in some way. But we use it in a negative way. So we need to think of some other kinds of terms, maybe, you know, supplemental or something, or something that's not so negative. We need to be inclusive in our unique services for groups, too. Uh, according to the demographics of our students, each institution in here probably has different characteristics of their students. So the services that you provide have got to be tailored to those students. See, people call me and they say, Dr. Ford, uh, who has a retention program that's working? Oh, you know, all of them work. I don't know anything you can do in retention that doesn't work. But what it is is that it needs to be tailored to your characteristics for it to be, for you to get the most effectiveness out of it. And be mindful, too, that you are cultivating future resources for your institutions, the alumni. If they leave you with a bitter taste, they're not about to send you money back here. They're not about to send any students back here, their children, their sisters, brothers, or whatever. So you want them, they can help you out, they can support scholarships, and they can help you politically because they can say things that you can't say and do things. Institutional accountability, principle number two. When you recruit and admit a student to your institution, you have made an offer. And when the student enrolls, you have formed a contract with that student. That student has expectations according to the yarn that was given to them on career night or some other recruitment occasion, or even from what you said in your catalog. So you are now accountable to the student. You are accountable for identifying and providing for the needs of the student, for bringing that student from where he or she is, where you found them, to where they should be. Time is not the major factor. Progress is. What you have admitted is what you have. So don't admit and then bemoan what you have. That's deceitful. And that backfires in the form of attrition. The American education system is the only one in the world that identifies what a student doesn't know and then punishes the student for it. We are the only ones who do that. So, Am I saying just take the best students? No. But let me share with you that the mentality and the thoughts nationally are changing in terms of retention, politically, on the political angle, that is. That they're, they, uh, you know, they are trying to cut out, and will perhaps cut out, a lot of support, funding support for supportive kinds of programs. And they're saying, you know, retention should be for getting the cream of the crop, the top 10%. And I don't su subscribe to that at all. Because if students are tops when you get them, and then they're good when they leave you, what have you done? Nothing. <laughs> Except maybe you didn't mess them up. And some, and some institutions, <laughs> some institutions do that to them too, and you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> The institution must be accountable for making a difference in the student. The student should have improved skills, increased competencies, uh, broad knowledge, sharpened critical thinking, and so forth. The institution cites or implies that it has quality. Now, it's a value term, but you know, you do this, you, you, you imply that you have quality service that's just right for the student. So the institution is accountable for delivery of quality service. This means that you have got to have in place those support systems that are necessary for uh, the student to experience success in college. 
There must be accountability for providing the student with the basic skills and values for success in tomorrow's world. Not today, but tomorrow's world. And we really don't even know what the 21st, yeah, 24, 21st century careers are going to be. So therefore, you know, what we have to do is just give good, sound education and developing certain attributes in these students to train them for professional success. And then in another area of accountability, we must do a better job in providing an understanding and assurance as to the value of a degree from your institution. You know, why was it wise, a wise choice for the student to come to your institution? What is it that you can do for the student that is so outstanding? And that's something that we don't do too much of. We think more in terms of a degree for so many hours, you know, of this and so many core courses, or hours in core courses and this in humanities. And, and you don't talk in terms of what the student would be able to do as a result of how they're going to grow and how they're going to develop as a result of being at your institution. Point three, a user-friendly campus. Now, we talk about this in terms of com um, computers, but if you're talking about creating a positive environment, you had best want a user-friendly campus. One part of that is to have customer satisfaction, because you do know students are your customers. And it's easier and more profitable to give good customer service in the beginning than it is to take customer complaints later. And if you want, what you want is a learning environment that promotes student satisfaction. And that learning environment includes the world surrounding the student, the tangible, the intangible, the internal, external, academic, and non-academic. Students want an environment that is safe, good security, nonviolent, free of racism, overt, covert, subtle. They want to be friendly, warm, and receptive. The community has a role in this, too. You don't want a hostile community. You've got to work to keep your customers satisfied, because they do spread the word. So I say we need to play a lot. We need to place a lot of emphasis on satisfaction of the students while we have them, and maybe less emphasis on you know, why they left try to figure out how to keep them. Because I tell you, unless you're very different, and I doubt that you are, when they're gone, they're gone, and they tell you anything, if anything. <laughs> you know, personal reasons, and that can be anything. We have a thing, and I know you probably have it too, what's called an exit interview, and that's a joke. Because we say when the students come in for the exit interview, the, the motor is running out there, and it's all packed up, and they just come in and tell you, bye, I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> but we have so many hoops for these students to jump through oftentimes that they just get no farther than where they started in the beginning. So they are frustrated, alienated, their nerves are wrecked, and they're, you know, we're just not too friendly to. If you ever pass through some of those lines during registration time and hear some of the comments that those students are making, you would understand uh, what, we're, what we're talking about. They, they kind of get tired of that. Um, the transfer student, I understand that in Georgia you do have an articulation plan, and that's wonderful. We have one in Florida, too. Because the transfer student often finds, you know, it very unfriendly. But if you have an articulation plan, that should smooth it out. Because in some cases, the, um, you know, the student gets, brings in those 60 hours, and then it's a battle. We're in a war zone trying to save uh, the 60 hours to end up with about well, about a third of those hours now. You know, this is critical because half of the black students in college are in the two-year institutions, and we're losing them. Something happens between the two-year and the four-year institution, they just drop in a hole. Uh, many of them don't even finish the two-year institution. Those who finish, we don't get them transferred in the rate that uh, they should be. Um, the special kinds of services I mentioned them, uh, minute ago about the unique characteristics of your students. And what I had in mind is, for example, those of you who have a large number of com commuting students, then you should think in terms of the class hours for a commuting student. Uh, many students are parents now, 
and uh, child care facilities or something for child care may be necessary. Many of them employed off campus, so you should have accommodating hours and so forth. And then, you know, students are getting older now, and older students have interests that are quite different from the younger students. Point number four is the bonding, outreach, and partnership. And bonding is just what it says, glue in and cement, and you, you know, you're building your student body through there. You can begin the bonding process anywhere. Some institutions start bonding in the seventh grade, and I understand now some are thinking about going down in the elementary grade. And this is where you have some kinds of program where you interact with the students and with the classes and, and made them bring them on campus for uh, special occasions. <coughs> and I say that when you recruit, you should recruit graduates. Now listen to what I'm saying. I'm not saying graduate students. Recruit graduates. In other words, it's not so much the interest in the freshman class as it is the class that you're going to graduate. So, you know, it's kind of neat if you address them in those terms as the, uh, the class of 1999 or the class of 2000 rather than the entering class of 1995. There's a gentleman out in um, uh, California, Dr. Reed Tuxel, who is the dean of the Charles Drew uh, Hospital in Los Angeles, who is doing a program with um, hardcore uh, black students out of um, Compton, California, you know, and, you know, Compton is a hotbed. And he brings these uh, kids in, and they're mostly boys, but not all boys, on Saturdays, and he dresses them in white coats. And he calls each one doctor. Don't you know what's going to happen with those students? And he says that he has no problems discipline-wise, and these are some hardcore kids. He has no discipline problems. They don't drop out, and they don't cut. They are there every Saturday. They just have to have something interesting to, um, to hold on to. Another thing that you th should think about is um, the loss that you have, what I call is uh, attrition before they enroll. Do you know that the national figure is 30%, that you lose 30% of your students between admission and enrollment? That's those who you call no-shows. And that's the resource pool. And of course, there are many reasons why they don't show. But that's something that you can um, look at. The outreach, of course, goes with the bonding in terms of going into the high schools or the elementary schools. And partnerships with businesses, partnerships in the community, and definitely with business to know that you are graduating your students to satisfy the world of work. The fifth principle is an established comfort factor. The comfort factor controls one's satisfaction with his environment. So a conducive learning environment embraces all of the culture, the habits, the decisions, practices, policies, everything that makes up campus life. Everything it affects the comfort factor, inclusive of the community. It is the sum total of the daily environment that creates the comfort factor. So students who feel unwelcome are alienated from the mainstream of the campus or the community are less likely to remain. And if they do, they're not likely to be too successful. You know, Jacqueline Fleming's book of Blacks in College says that beyond money, beyond aptitude. Black students are best retained in colleges by those things that produce a feeling of connection to the environment. And Vincent Tinto tells us that 85% of the dropouts in college are for personal experiences and not so much uh, academic. We can hardly expect to find a comfort factor in the midst of racism and ethno violence on our campuses. Unfortunately, racism is very much alive and running rampant. The racist skeletons are coming out of the closet and parading around on our campuses and doing a lot of damage. We have to realize that our campuses are no longer academic sanctuaries. They are indeed reflections of the communities, the faculty, administrators, 
and students bring with them their values and their prejudices. You know what's happening right now at Rutgers with the president who made a statement about the inferior level of a black student. And he's the president of the, uh, of the institution. The past few years have brought a very disturbing increase of racially and ethnically motivated violence and conflict on our campuses across the country. You see it in the papers, the various kinds of things that they are doing. Uh, it can be overt and conspicuous, but it's usually quite subtle. And more frequently, the problems are not obvious to everyone. But minority students often feel marginal, conspicuous, alienated, isolated from the mainstream. They're not a part of the campus community. They don't hold memberships and offices in the student organizations. And when they do, it makes the front page. You know, the first this and the first that, the first president, the first queen. When we get past those firsts, then we know we have arrived. But as long as it's a first, that means what? It never was before, so we've still got a problem. They are not part of study groups. You know, they're not in that good old girl, good old boy network, and you know, those sorority and fraternity files and so forth. And they don't get that ready access to class notes. The scarcity of minority students, faculty, and administrators is perceived as a problem too. Our students want to see some role models in administrative positions and in all positions. And then we have a way of double standards. We look at things that minority students do and we look at it in a negative way and other students can do the same thing and it's a little bit different. Minority students can group together at a table and it's said, oh, they're segregating themselves. They're separatists, they're isolates. And then others can group at the table and they say, they're networking. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, this is happening nationally now too that blacks are, have become scapegoats for crime. You know, the situation of the young lady, just to show you something. When Susan drowned her kids and had accused the black man, everybody was outraged. Now you know, in South Carolina, <laughs> no black man is gonna drive a stolen car with two white babies crying in the back. <laughs> and when they found out that Susan did it, oh, what a shame. How could she? See the difference in the attitude? The same thing happened in, what was it, Philadelphia or Boston, where the man killed his wife and accused the black man. And everybody was all up in the air. And I think they even, you know, arrested some or questioned some. And then when they found out he did it, oh, he must be sick. How could he? <laughs> Those things happen. If I ask you, how many of you have heard of O.J. Simpson? I bet everybody's hand would go up, wouldn't it? <laughs> If I ask you how many of you heard R.L. Citron, two or three hands would go up, if any. At least, and you say, yeah, who's he? I know, because you know what? What O.J. Simpson is accused of, by all stretch of the imagination, directly affects three families. Simpson, the Browns, and um, Goldman. What R.L. Citron did was messed up all the money and threw Orange County, California into bankruptcy. Now you're gonna tell me that's more than three families and you don't even hear about him. And his case is going on just about two blocks from, my, from O.J. Simpson. <laughs> Nason brought down the Barron's Bank, 232 years old. 
And when they found out he was in trouble, you know what they did? They pushed him a million dollars trying to cover it up, but it still didn't work. And it still went up. Do you think they would have done that for one of us? No. So you see, we have those double standards. We have these double standards where we have the uh, non-minority women who will shift the purses to the other shoulder when they are meeting someone of you. These things affect our students. I know of a case where at night, around 11 or 12 o'clock at night, a group of black boys were out on the campus talking, you know, just shooting the bull. And the security just got all bent out of shape because they just knew they were up to doing something and they wouldn't have thought that otherwise. So these are some of the kinds of things that uh, happen uh, to us. Inappropriate racial and ethnic remarks and ethnic jokes. Ethnic jokes are not funny. Unconscious assumptions that minority students are unable to perform. And if you think that, of course, they won't. Self-fulfilling prophecy. Dissimilar eye contact, you can't look them in the eye. My grandmother always told me that if they can't look you in the eye, something wrong. And you should be able to look your students in the eye. And black students tell us, you know, that's kind of a problem with non-black faculty. They can't look them in the eye. Then you can even have body language and voice inflections which denote disgust and rejection and all of those kinds of things. Those do not make for positive campus environment. They do not make up a comfortable zone or build the comfort factor. So what we find is that often the minority student has to spend energy on emotions due to isolation, injustice, insensitive to alienation and inequity. They have to spend energy on proving their worthiness and then even when they prove somebody think they cheated or somebody else did it for them. They're spending energy combating negative attitudes, coping with innuendos, coping with negative body language, and then still supposed to have energy for acquisition of knowledge and academic performance. Don't you know that something is going to get shortchanged? And usually, it's academics. Because these other factors are emotional and they must be dealt with before the student can really perform to give them that learning environment. And number six, a caring and nurturing are your freshmen and sophomores. Your freshmen are your most important product. They're very fragile, they're very precious. And if you can preserve your freshman class, then you don't have to worry about your graduating class. And for every year that you can hold your freshmen intact, the attrition rate cuts by, uh, drops by 50%. So first term is very important because what you find, that's where you have your highest attrition rate. And it's not unusual that the high point is first uh, in between two to six weeks. Not between semesters, but in their first semester. So this is um, you know, something that we need to look at. Freshmen need to be embraced with understanding, a warm welcome, nurturing and caring, and let me tell you, it does not dilute educational quality to give a little nurturing and care. You should have, now this is not popular, but it's the truth, I'm sorry. You should have your best teachers for the freshman classes, because they're so fragile. I know, you know, it's a glory to be uh, this senior class, this, uh, for those who have graduate courses and all that. But you know, by the time they get seniors, if they need all that cuddling, Something has happened wrong those other years, don't you think so? They ought to be ready to kind of make it on their own then. So your best teachers are needed there for that class. Um, you need academic advisement and extended orientation. Orientation has got to be more than two or three days. It should be a minimum of a semester and better if it's a year. Should be required, should be for credit, and must be a substance. It's reported that three out of four entering freshmen uh, uh, un are uncertain about their career choice and they tend to drop out if they don't know what they want to do. Then we move on to um, a point that I wanted to make on um, support systems. Construction workers wear their, oh, wear their hard hats, 
you know, electricians wear insulated gloves, law enforcement officers wear their uh, bulletproof vests, and welders wear protective goggles and all that. So in academia, we too need a safety net to, to, to catch our students, and definitely to catch them before they fall, and hope that they don't fall, but if they do, we need something to catch them then. And our safety net is a comprehensive support system. Um, like if you're tutorials, learning centers, uh, supplementary courses, academic skills lab, peer counseling, and you need a slew of counseling services now, you know, personal, financial, career, family, academic, trauma, everything now. You, you got to do the whole bag. You need early warning, something to tell you when the student is about to drop out. You have pre-registration and the student doesn't pre-register. You have housing sign up and the student doesn't sign up for housing. The student is not attending class. These are some warnings. And then you should have something to address that. And mentoring, of course. And I'm sure that you understand the value of mentoring and that um, this gives you contact outside of class and it's very definite we know that the more time that you spend, informal time that you spend with students outside the class, uh, the, the greater their uh, potential for success. The um, orientation I mentioned should be more than uh, two or three days and we call them all kinds of names and that doesn't matter, that's okay, whatever we call it, uh, just, so we, just so we have that. And then the last one, number seven, caring and nurturing faculty. What kind of faculty is this? This faculty would be objective. They know that the job is to teach all students, to be fair and impartial, and, to don't, and, and they will not let stereotype judgment get in the way. This is a faculty that's flexible. They know that it may take different strokes for different folks. And they make use of a variety of teaching methods and they're willing to try something new and to come off that old comfortable chair. This is the way we've always done it. This is a faculty that's accessible. You schedule your office hours, you ought to be there. You cannot operate by remote control. <laughs> Spend time with your students other than formal class time. And be approachable. No student should be afraid to come to you. And I know you've had students who've talked to you and you say, well, have you been to see Dr. Ford about that? And they say, oh, no, I can't talk to her. I'm afraid. That should never be. It should be approachable. This is a faculty that's open-minded. Understand that all students can learn. Forget about all this probability curve and Murder and Hernstein running out there ringing their bell. You know, <laughs> um, I'm sure they've never flown into the Los Angeles airport because the black man was the architect for that airport, you know. I'm sure they don't observe traffic signals. They have to be wrong because the black man invented the traffic signal. I'm sure that they don't wear shoes. Black man invented shoes. And I hope they never need blood plasma. All right. Dr. Drew, black man, was the one who did that. Now I'll tell you. And then food, with all those thousands of products that George Washington Carver did from the peanut, you can hardly eat anything that's not impacted by that. So I say, my Lord, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. If we can do all of that, with inferior intelligence, what would we do if we had the intelligence that they say we should have? <laughs> Talking about this caring and nurturing teacher now. Teaching is a skill and an art that when you master it, students will learn. You know, Higher education is the only segment of our educational continuum where you can teach without teaching credentials. Even in the public schools, you've got to have a teaching certificate. 
Even if you start out with a, with a provisional um, certificate, you eventually have to have one. And in higher education, that's not true. Now, you know, and I, I was thinking, um, when you fly, if there were an aeronautical engineer who knew everything that there was to know about the airplane, could even build the airplane, but had never had flight lessons, <laughs> would you want that person to fly you? <laughs> Somebody who's a physiologist and knows everything about the body, the, you know, your veins, your system, your tissues, your bones, everything, but they had not been to med school, you want them to do surgery on you? Uh -uh. But that's what we do. A person is an expert or a specialist or what are well trained in a given field and know nothing about teaching. And then we blame who? The students. Think about that. So therefore, we need faculty development. We need workshops, seminars, conferences, and all that on learning styles, teaching methods, uh, assessment, or multiculturalism, and all those kinds of things. There is one school where, I think it's in Indiana, I'm not sure, but there is a school where the new teachers are paired off with the master teachers, or older teachers, to kind of get them acquainted with how to teach. And that's not um, a bad I do. Unfortunately, the other thing that happens is that some teachers get caught up in teaching the subject. You know, I call it showcasing, because they want to show how much they know, and then they lose sight that they should be teaching the student and not teaching the subject. It's a difference. It takes more skill to teach the student. I mean, you can go out, go out there in the parkway or anywhere and, and teach a subject. But one problem is, <laughs> It's often ego. You know, they get in this ivory tower syndrome, I got mine, and now it's up to you to get it. And then they throw it out and say, sink or swim. You don't want to be like that. The caring and nurturing teacher, sensitive, recognizes and respects cultural diversity. Minority students do not want to be assimilated. They want to be accepted shouldn't have to change. This is a teacher who humanizes the classroom, non-threatening, non-humiliating, you don't demean your students, and you don't talk about you people, <laughs> your people. You know, we're all in it together. A teacher who is aware are the intangibles as well as the tangibles that affect students, the body language. <laughs> those of you in psychology remember Joe Harris windows, those four boxes that we operate out of. It's one who understands the social and political environment, which may be stressful to minorities, as I've just given you some examples. And they understand the heavy baggage that minority students bring with them. They are running a race with weights on their feet with the baggage that they bring. Single parent families, low income, no role models, all of those things. The caring and nurturing teacher will know students by name. Unless you've got one of these classes of four or 500, we can understand that. But otherwise, know the name, be able to pronounce it and spell it. Our names affirm us. You have even said, oh, she knew me by my name. She called my name. And it's interesting for the conference that I do, and we send out mass mailing, and people will spend 32 cents now to let us know the name Green is without an E, or it's with an E, whichever way we did it wrong. The name is important, and it's no different for your students. To show interest in the success of your students, a high percentage of failure rate is no glory. I say you have failed if your students have failed. Be partners, I see the word partners. Be partners with your students in the learning process. Assist them with strengthening their weaknesses. Demand 
quality performance. Tell them they've got to give 100%. You know the old gospel? 99 and a half won't do. <laughs> you know it. <laughs> Tell them that that elevator to success is out of order. <laughs> they got to climb the stairs of work. High expectations of your students. You remember the California experiment where they gave low achieving students to a teacher and told the teacher they were high achievers and then gave high achieving students to a teacher and told them they were low achievers and they performed just like that because of teacher expectations. You've got to stop the revolving door for minority students, you know, in and out the same year. Need to put a time lock on that door. Opens only at graduation. And stop using standardized tests as gatekeepers. <laughs> you use those for gate openers, for diagnostic purposes, to help you and to help them. Help your students to develop a positive self-concept. You know, I am somebody. Because as one develops a positive self-concept, they become more open to new experiences and help them to build self-confidence because they'll do what they think they can do. The bumblebee, you know, by all laws of physics, the breadth and depth of the body and the wingspan of the bumblebee, the bumblebee is not supposed to fly. But guess what? The bumblebee doesn't know that. So the bumblebee flies. And our students will do the same thing. If we stop putting all these negative labels on them and telling them that they are underprepared and inferior and at risk and all of that, they will lift up and do the song that you sang. Something so strong in me, they will do it. You know, right now, the ringing Miss America, Heather Whitestone. Do you know something unique about her? She's deaf. Or as they say, not hearing impaired. The doctor said that she would never go beyond the fourth grade. But they say Heather wasn't listening. <laughs> And she is right now, your 1995 Miss America. And tell your students to use obstacles as their stepping stones and not their stumbling blocks. And if they have to fall, to fall on their back. Because if you fall on your back, you can look up. Right. And if you can look up, you can get up. And just be human. Smile at your students. You know it takes more muscles to frown than to smile. And those are my seven principles. Now I'm going to conclude with a message on retention from the television shows. Our students are dialing Rescue 911. They recognize that they have one life to live. But they see it is in jeopardy as they live on the edge of night. They know that cheers cannot come from the wheel of fortune, even if the price is right. <laughs> Thus, they look to us to be their guiding light before someone pulls the evening shade. Thank you. <laughs>